which is the United States. So I want to discuss big tech in the context of US antitrust law. And the point I wanna make is very simple. There, there, there are three elements to this. One is 50 years ago, antitrust law was seen as the protector of small and medium-sized businesses from predation by larger companies. So that's actually the issue that's going on now. Two, over the last 50 years, that original goal, protecting small and medium-sized businesses, was thrown aside by the Chicago School of Antitrust Analysis that favored economic efficiency over social goals. In other words, antitrust enforcement began to favor larger efficient companies over smaller ones. Uh, and the so-called consumer welfare standard became the basis of antitrust enforcement. And that view affected or infected antitrust agencies and the courts. Three, right now in the United States, there is a sudden apparent outrage against the dominance of large companies, especially the four big tech companies, although it applies to other industries as well. And their outraged demands in Congress for more aggressive antitrust enforcement and more lawsuits. And also state officials. We have 50 states. State officials each have an attorney general who needs to get reelected, and they're bringing their own antitrust cases, although they frankly don't know very much. The enforcement problem is that the populist goals protecting small businesses are exactly contrary to established antitrust law. So maybe ultimately the laws will change, but there's a constitutional problem in applying new laws retroactively. So the challenge to big tech is that they're being sued under antitrust law. The challenge to the governments that are bringing these lawsuits are that the law has for 50 years favored large efficient companies. And most of these, the, the big tech companies are gonna argue that they're being penalized for being efficient and doing exactly what they were supposed to do under the antitrust laws. So that's the challenge on both sides. So I wanna start by talking about a case that was decided by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1966 called Vaughn's Groceries. This was a merger case where the merging parties had a combined market share of 7.5%. In other words, it was minuscule. Today, under antitrust agency merger guidelines, that wouldn't even cause a needle to move. But in 1966, the Supreme Court reversed the merger to restore competition. It forbid the merger from taking place. And the Supreme Court said, from this country's beginning, there has been abiding and widespread fear of the evils that flow from monopoly, that is the concentration of economic power in the hands of few. It quoted from an 1897 case about the Sherman Act being passed to halt practices by which large companies have succeeded by driving out of business the small dealers and worthy men whose lives have been spent therein, in their businesses, and who might be unable to readjust themselves to their altered circumstances. So the basic teaching of the Vaughn's grocery case in the Supreme Court was that the antitrust laws were designed to protect small and medium-sized businesses and to preserve social values that were based on small businesses being able to compete successfully. But that approach was about to suffer an imminent death. So beginning in the 1970s, the Chicago School of Economic Criticism began to advocate the self-sufficiency of economic analysis. They actually mocked the Supreme Court and mocked Vaughn's Grocery for interfering in what they said was the economic self-sufficiency of markets. Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, who was often considered the greatest antitrust judge in the United States, was a leading revolutionary in antitrust thinking, and he and other members of the Chicago School concluded that Vaughn's Grocery was a totally amateurish, socially based, imprecise, vague attempt to um, achieve some antitrust policy, but it was all wrong because it didn't take into account economics. Uh, Richard Posner taught economics at the Chicago, University of Chicago, so he was a little bit biased. But um, then in 1978, Robert Bork wrote a book called The Antitrust Paradox. The paradox, he claimed, 
was that antitrust laws protected small and inefficient businesses from competition. That's exactly the opposite of what Vaughn's Grocery decided. Bork believed that economic efficiency and the consumer welfare standard were the only goals of the antitrust laws, even though they didn't appear in any of the legislative history of the, anti of the Sherman Act that was passed in 1890. So the consumer welfare standard, which is supposedly the basis on which the antitrust agencies operate today, the consumer welfare standard focuses on benefits to consumers, not competitors. Um, for example, lower prices, Increased innovation and better service are member are tests of the whether the consumer standard welfare standards being fulfilled. So you can see that in a company, if a company actually gives away free products, this whole consumer welfare standard doesn't work at all because there are no prices. Um, but in any event, antitrust enforcement has followed the consumer welfare standard for forty years. Uh, law schools judge and federal agencies have followed these principles and ignored the impact their policies have had on American life and American economy. Economic analysis and economic efficiency is the only key. Um, in, in fact, there are many people in the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission who claim that the antitrust laws were passed solely to achieve economic efficiency, even though it's clear that when the law was passed in 1890, the mantra was big is bad. And by the way, the head of the FTC said not more than uh, 18 months ago, <clears throat> big is not necessarily bad. So it shows how the original purpose of the antitrust laws has been subverted. So um, in, in fact, the it's interesting, the um, dominance of economics is so great that when you're handling a merger and you talk to a lawyer at the FTC or the DOJ about your case, they'll often tell you, I can't even speak to you without my economist because I'm not authorized to make decisions in this case. So that's that's the point at which economy has, economics has overwhelmed the antitrust analysis. So we said that the consumer welfare standard focuses on benefits to consumers, not competitors. So the arguable benefits of that policy would be lower prices, new services, and better quality. But what do you do when a big tech company can offer not only lower prices, but no prices at all, in other words, free services, when it constantly innovates and when it constantly produces new services to attract and sustain its existing customer base? What happens if these three pro-competitive elements make it difficult for new competitors who claim they're competitively handicapped. So the problem, the problem is that if you apply the consumer welfare standard, which has been applied for 40 years, these big, cap, big tech companies are doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing and do not, and they actually appear to be achieving the goals of the antitrust laws. So with this as background, let's jump into big tech in the United States. We supposedly have general outrage against four companies, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Uh, it's not clear whether consumers are complaining or just our corrupt politicians are using it as a basis to get reelected. But whoever is complaining, they claim that these companies are too large and have too much power. And one question you might ask is, how do they get so large and have so much power? And the answer is, they achieve their status today with the help of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, the two antitrust agencies that monitor antitrust enforcement in the United States. Every acquisition, you realize that a lot of these companies are being accused of buying up smaller competitors in order to achieve their current position. Every acquisition they made was either approved, expressly approved by the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission, or was a transaction that the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice could have challenged. Because in this country, any merger can be challenged, whether it's reported or not. In fact, the Department of Justice once challenged a $3 million merger. Of course, merger not, control is not the only way the antitrust agencies can challenge competitive behavior. 
they can also, I mean, the, the main tool they would normally use would be the monopolization laws. So in the United States, the act of monopolization requires one, the possession of monopoly power, which is a very large market share, generally over 60%. And two, the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth based on superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. So that's great to say. What does this mean in action? It means that large companies that compete aggressively and destroy their competitors may not be committing any antitrust violations at all because the Supreme Court has, has said repeatedly that what the antitrust laws were designed to achieve is competition. Competition is based on economic efficiency and smaller companies that can't afford or can't are not able to, to behave in a competitive way and go out of business. That's, that's not an antitrust violation to drive them out of business. You're actually proving the vitality of the antitrust laws. Um, even today, the Department of Justice Antitrust Enforcement Manual says in chapter one, section three, mere harm to competitors does not violate section two. Um, and there's a similar concept uh, the, that, that was for enforcement of merger law, uh, uh, monopolization law, there's a similar concept in uh, merger law. More than that, it's a basic principle of US antitrust law that a competitor does not need to help another competitor or assist anybody in entering the market. So in fact, cold-blooded aggressive competition is exactly what the antitrust laws were intended to achieve for the last 50 years. Um, here's another example of how antitrust law has been perverted from its original aim. In 1936, Congress passed the robinson patman Act. That's a price discrimination case. And it was passed to protect small businesses against the buying power of large chains. So in the 1930s, large grocery stores and large pharmacies were getting huge discounts from manufacturers and mom and pop stores. In other words, local stores, local standalone individual stores couldn't compete because they were being overcharged for the same products that chain stores were getting at a much bigger discount. Um, that law was passed in 1936. The Department of Justice refuses to enforce it. It refuses to enforce a federal law because they claim that law is actually anti-competitive. So that's the situation that we have today in the United States. So let's look at the legal challenges against some of these companies. So let's start with Facebook. Facebook is in a vulnerable position because it has privacy problems and these are well deserved it lied to consumers many times about what it was doing and uh how it was preserving confidential information and there's been they've been fined five billion dollars uh many people don't think that's enough but that's not an antitrust issue that's a privacy issue which is a totally separate matter so there are two ways to attack Facebook. One is its Instagram acquisition in 2012 for $1 billion. Uh, Twitter had offered $525 million and got outbid. So at that time, so, uh, sorry, I just want to say, when you're looking at a merger, the question is, is this acquisition likely to substantially lessen competition? And you measure that at the time the merger takes place. So at the time of the merger in 2012, Instagram had never turned a profit. It had 2% of the users it had today. It has, it had 13 employees. It had no revenue. It had no infrastructure of its own. It had service issues. It could have been become a major competitor to uh, Facebook, but who knows? Because <clears throat> the question is for the government now is how is it going to establish that at the time of the merger, there was a substantial lessening of competition um, when, in fact, the only measure of Instagram's success is that for eight years it had the benefit of incredibly deep pockets and was able to build out an infrastructure that it had no intention of doing on its own. 
So to succeed by itself and to become a substantial competitor, which is the test for, for a merger, the question is, Instagram would have had to come up with its own financing, its own ad technology, and it wouldn't have had the benefit of offering multiple platforms for ads, which arguably benefits consumers as well as advertisers. And there's another alternative, which is Facebook could have achieved almost the same result by copying Instagram and nobody would have been able to complain about organic development because there's no law that prevents one company from entering a market like entering Instagram's market and duplicating its product. You, there may be some intellectual property issues, but you cannot obviously copyright a concept like Instagram and there, Facebook would have been able with its deep pockets to enter that market on its own. So that's one of the, that's, those are the, some problems facing the government's challenge to the Instagram acquisition of Facebook. In 19, in 2014, Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. WhatsApp is another point of controversy. So, um, did that substantially lessen competition? Uh, let's remember that the consumer welfare standard applies to the to antitrust questions, um, and one of the elements of the consumer welfare standard is that it produces lower prices for consumers. So, what Facebook did when they bought WhatsApp in 2014 is they ended the charges that WhatsApp imposed on its viewers. So, I charged. Uh, a commercial product that had a, had a usage charge became free. In other words, they lowered the price. So um, it's a little difficult to see how this is an exercise of monopoly power. Monopoly power is the power to raise prices. But in this case, Facebook lowered prices, exactly the opposite. Um, so what about the FTC case against Facebook? That, that 37 states have joined. So in the United States, when the federal government, when the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission bring a lawsuit, the state attorney generals almost always hop on the bandwagon because they don't have to do any work and they get a free ride and maybe we'll get reelected. So the complaint that the Federal Trade Commission filed earlier this year tries to undo the acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. That case was dismissed a month ago by the court. The it dismissed, as far as the states go, the, the 37 states, the judge held that the acquisitions took place too long ago for the states to challenge. So they're out of the case completely. So much for the 37 states. The Federal Trade Commission's complaint was dismissed uh, because it Facebook because the Federal Trade Commission failed to allege facts that show that Facebook had monopoly power in the social media market. So monopoly power is the power to fix prices or exclude competition. Often you start with a surrogate like a market share, generally 60%, 70% is the minimum that is necessary to show um, monopoly power. But the uh, Federal Trade Commission didn't even make that, wasn't able to, it wasn't able to make that. It has the ability to file an amended complaint uh, next week. But the question is, the judge emphasized the difficulty of establishing monopoly power for a free service. So again, here's a case where the antitrust agencies for 40 years have pushed a theory of, of antitrust law that's now coming back to undermine their attempts to control Facebook. So um, as I was saying, the judge dismissed the complaint against the FTC, the FTC's complaint because they didn't allege that it had monopoly power. Uh, so the question is, is the Federal Trade Commission going to be able to allege that. There, the, as I said, the, the, the definition of monopoly, monopoly power is, as I said before, often inferred from market share. But the ultimate question is, is a, there are the power to fix prices or exclude competition. So even if Facebook had 100% of the market, 
The question is, could they fix prices and could they raise prices? If there are no prices, there's no prices to be raised, then you have an inevitable problem here. Then there's the question of whether the Federal Trade Commission is even going to be able to define a market properly. So, for example, they claimed that Facebook was its own market. It's clear there are other social media. TikTok has claims it has 50 million users. Twitter has 40 million. Um, Federal Trade Commission used a narrow market definition that excludes YouTube and LinkedIn, which are other social media platforms. Um, and one of the questions for the courts is with the change in the changing evolution of technology and social media platforms, can a court even be in the position of deciding what competes get what? what? So this is a question of market definition, which is a fundamental issue of antitrust law in the United States. Um, courts, in, in 1995, the Department of Justice brought an enforcement action against Microsoft, which it basically lost. And the a Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit decided that it was difficult to define markets and you have to be very careful in evolving technology markets because you don't want to do anything that might actually stifle competition as opposed to enhance it. And the same question is true here, which is if you if you take an artificially narrow definition of social media, you're actually impeding the market, not helping it. So the Federal Trade Commission has to submit an amended complaint next week. The question is, is it going to try to gerrymander the market and take an artificially small market in order to try to show it Facebook has 60% of the market? If it does, that complaint is subject to dismissal. And even if it succeeds, Facebook is obviously going to defend the case by saying that's only an initial test. The question is, do we have the power to raise prices? If there are no prices, Facebook is going to argue that, in fact, they're carrying out the the, the ultimate goal of the consumer, consumer welfare standard, which is lower prices or no prices. So that's the situation with Facebook in the United States. It looked like it was a great case, but in fact, the complaint has been dismissed. So let's turn to Amazon right now. So there are many people complaining about Amazon and it's really not too clear what their legitimate antitrust complaints are. Senator Amy Klobuchar, who's been whining about the failure of antitrust law for years is worried now. Her most recent complaint is that Amazon Alexa is collecting secret information from your houses and that Amazon is basically spying on Americans who have Alexa installed in their homes. Uh, but that's not an antitrust issue. Social media critics, social critics claim that Amazon has too much data. It knows what you read, what you buy, what you eat because it bought Whole Foods. On the other hand, no one has ever pointed to any rule against collecting data on your customers, even from different sources. In fact, smaller competitors want the same data because it's useful. So let us look at the case that the Attorney General of the District of Columbia recently filed against Amazon. So the Attorney General is elected. He needs to get reelected. That's why they keep bringing these cases. So his case claims that Amazon discriminates in benefits to its sellers that don't offer the best prices on Amazon. So, so what it means is if an Amazon seller sells in another forum at a lower price, that seller does not get the benefit of a lot of Amazon perks, including being included in the Amazon buy box. So Amazon discriminates against sellers if they don't offer the lowest price on Amazon. So, the basis of the Attorney General of the District of Columbia said these restrictions allow Amazon to build and maintain monopoly power. Um, the basis of the lawsuit is that Amazon is guilty of ensuring that its own customers get the lowest prices. So again, 
And monopoly power is the power to raise prices without the fear of being retaliated against. And Amazon is trying to get the lowest prices for its consumers. Does this strike anybody as odd and contradictory? So in other words, if the consumer welfare standard says the antitrust laws are being fulfilled when consumers get lower prices and Amazon is ensuring that its consumers get lower prices, how can this possibly be an exercise of monopoly power? So that's one fundamental defect. Amazon has made a motion to dismiss. It hasn't been briefed yet, but it's clear that the court is going to be asked to decide how lower prices can be an exercise of monopoly power. This is similar to the defect in the Facebook complaint, um, which is a point of showing that you can have large efficient companies that are actually lowering prices, not increasing them, which is a results in this paradox of the antitrust laws being used to complain that prices are too low. Um, the other element of the uh, this lawsuit is that it claims that um, Amazon's market share of online sales is 70%, which would be enough to provide an inference of monopoly power. But other industry data puts it at 40%, which is a radically different uh, number and radically different market inferences. So in fact, one of the benefits uh, argued benefits of Amazon is one stop shopping for practically anything, even if lower prices were available someplace else. The question is would efficiency minded consumers sacrifice convenience for marginally lower prices if they were available? So these are all questions that are raised very fundamental defects in the complaint that has been brought against Amazon. And uh, so when you talk about problems for big tech, um, the problem that Amazon faces, it's being accused of lowering prices for its own customers. Let's turn to Apple. Um, so Apple has been exposed to several lawsuits, including Apple versus Pepper that went to the Supreme Court two years ago, and the Epic lawsuit. These cases allege that Amazon runs a monopoly by being the only possible source of iOS downloads for apps. So in other words, if you have an iPhone, you can't go to the software developer and buy your product. You have to use the, the app store. Um, so uh, these cases are a little confused actually, because it's not clear exactly what the complaint is. Um, sometimes they claim that Apple is tying the app store to the phone. But if it's sold as an integrated package, there's one product, not two, so you can't even have a tie. But um, anyway, the, the, the issue is that Apple is accused of being the only possible source of iOS apps for iPhones. Apple charges 30% to operate this store. And by the way, I find this sort of amusing that people are worried about this when the average cost of an iOS app is 82 cents. So, um, the, the margin, even though the iPhone, the app store makes a lot of money, um, the amount of money involved for consumers is very low. But anyway, in the Epic case, Epic sold games in the app store. Epic sold, sells video games in general. It decided to sell on its own site and bypass the 30% commission that Apple requires. Apple cut them off from the app store. They sued. And the judge pointed out that it looked like Epic was trying to excuse itself from paying the fees that it agreed to when it when it got admitted to the App Store. So the trial is over; it's taken place. We're awaiting a decision. What are the problems with this? Some of the problems with this case. First, the question is: Again, does Apple have a monopoly? Normally, one brand, uh, iPhones, iOS, is not a market. You have to take a look at what other alternatives consumers have out there. So there are plenty of Android phones and they're switching all the time. So the question is, does Apple even have monopoly power? Second, if you look at all smartphones and Apple has 50% of the smartphones, that may not be enough to show monopoly power because courts have generally required 
something like 60%, not 50%. And again, the question is, do they have power to fix prices or exclude competition? So the question is, if Apple were to raise its prices, would people move to Android? Third, Fortnite is a video game. And an iPhone is just one of the many platforms on which you can play this game. So Apple has argued that Apple's competition isn't just Android, it's Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and anywhere else where the Epic game is available. Apple says it can't have monopoly power in that market where there's so much competition. And that's actually a very credible basis uh, for the court to rule in Apple's favor, because it's clear that you cannot artificially gerrymander markets under U.S. antitrust law. They have to be taken into account all the alternatives that a consumer has. Uh, so, fourth, Apple argues that its tight control over iOS is necessary to keep the system secure and protect the privacy of its users. So Apple says that it vets every app that's allowed into the App Store for malware. Uh, that may be true, and that would be an, uh, some value that Apple would be delivering for the 30%. Fifth, Apple claims that part of the commissions that charges for digital payments go to funding the App Store, which provides the tools that help developers build software for iOS. So that's pro-competitive. By the way, the 30% number doesn't mean anything. Um, there, there's a Supreme Court case called Pacific Bell versus Linkline, where it says simply possessing monopoly power and charges and charging monopoly prices does not violate the monopolization laws. So if Apple provides a virtual, a virtual store and provides at least some arguable services including assuring operability and freedom from malware, can you actually argue that it's not entitled to something for its services? So what percentage becomes illegal? 5%, 10%, 20%, or even 30% could not be illegal since charging monopoly prices is not an antitrust violation. Um, so um, Epic is argued that this was unfair because Android users can download from outside the, outside the Google store. But there's some potentially interesting arguments about comparing Android to Apple users from an antitrust point of view. For one, the second you do that, it undermines the, it undermines the argument that they're Apple and Android are not in the same market. And that in turn undermines the monopoly, the monopoly power theory which is essential to bring this type of case. And two, this is very interesting. There are major demographic differences between Apple and Android users that could support an argument that most iOS users prefer liability as opposed to marginally lower prices. There've been a lot of studies actually comparing the type of people who use iPhones versus Android phones and there's a very significant difference in the amount of time they spend, the types of applications that they use, and the uses to which they put their phones. Um, it's, it, the studies are very interesting. Um, but in any event, if this case ever gets to trial, because the Apple versus Pepper case is still coming up, uh, that's something that's going to be an interesting thing to see how it works out. So those are the problems with the um, the Apple case. Uh, the judge has to decide. Um, the, the trial is finished. The judge is uh, preparing her decision, and um, it certainly will be appealed and may go to the Supreme Court. So uh, because it raises fundamental antitrust issues. So that's the situation with Apple. So and now we come to Google. Um, and there are three cases going on. The Department of Justice filed the first case in October, and it was joined by 11 state attorney generals. This is the narrowest of lawsuit. It claims that Google has used anti-competitive tactics to protect its monopoly over general search terms and prevent rival search engines from getting a foothold. So, the complaint charges that, for example, 
Google pays Apple $12 million billion a year to make Apple the default standard on Safari and iPhones. The Department of Justice argues that this is a legal scheme to maintain Google's monopoly over search. So what are the answers to this? Apple, uh, sorry, Google's answers are very simple. Uh, they say it's easy for users to change the default if they want. And I don't think, uh, you know, it was one thing in 1995 when the Department of Justice sued Microsoft over Netscape, because in those days, people really didn't know how to install new applications on their computers. But I don't think anybody would ever claim today that anybody, including a five-year-old, doesn't know how to install new apps on their phone or changing defaults. So. As Google's chief counsel put it, people don't use Apple because Google because they have to, they use it because they choose to. And if it's a consumer choice, that completely undermines the, the notion of an antitrust violation. And, you know, it's consumer welfare standard that supposedly applies. Um, so that, that's an issue in one Google case, and that case is still in the process of having a motion to dismiss. The second case about Google search and the third, uh, it, it, this comes from more than 30 states. It's basically the same argument as the Department of Justice lawsuit. Um, and it argues that Google has made changes over the years to allow search results and drive more traffic to its own properties rather than a vertical search. So Google's response is simple. It says, I, we, they made these changes to make the Google search more useful and relevant to consumers. And if that's true, there's absolutely no violation of the antitrust laws. Um, and by the way, there is absolutely no law in the United States that prevents a company from driving one aspect of its business operations to another aspect of its business operations. So in a vertically integrated, diverse company, it can certainly promote one business operation and use it to promote a second business operation. A business in the United States does not have any obligation to help competitors go into business or stay in business. That's very clear. So there's one more case. Um, this is another group of attorney generals who also want to get reelected. And this focuses on Google's control over digital advertising, um, apart from the core search advertising business. And what it claims is that um, because Google operates multiple parts of the digital advertising supply chain, um, it has a conflict of interest. But the thing is, conflicts of interest are not part of the antitrust laws. In fact, conflict of interest are not even part of normal contractual law. When a party deals with another party at an arm's length basis, there is no conflict of interest because there's no fiduciary duty. So the question is whether this case is going to be dismissed too. So I'm sorry for boring you with these long details about U.S. antitrust law. Uh, and where does this leave us? There's no guarantee that the government won't win any of these cases, although, you know, the government's complaint has been dismissed in two of these matters already. Um, and if they lose, then it's possible that Congress will change the laws. But if Congress will ch is going to change the laws, then from a constitutional point of view, the question is, can you apply these laws retroactively? So, for example, if you were to change the merger laws to say that any company that had more than 20% of a market can't acquire another business in that market, you can't apply it retroactively because that's um, would be built virtually a bill of attainder. So I hope this hasn't been too boring. I thank you for inviting me. I wish I could uh, apply it on Indian law as uh, relates to big tech. If I understand correctly, uh, you have not adopted the U.S. model um, and you your laws are more flexible in giving expression to abuse of a dominant position, which is certainly a stronger argument to be made against these companies. No such concept 
exist in the United States, even if you have a monopoly, you still can compete aggressively, and there are many courts that have upheld that. So, so as I said before, you have a situation where at least the politicians are complaining against about these four large big tech companies, not the consumers, but the politicians. Um, and the basis of their complaint is that they don't, they won't admit it, but the basis of their complaint is that the antitrust laws have basically hijacked the original purpose of antitrust law 50 years ago, changed it and made it possible for these companies, these four companies to grow and flourish and remain immune from the antitrust laws. So that's the challenges facing big tech, and that's the paradox of antitrust treatment of big tech in the United States. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody is awake, and I am love to hear some views about how this is different from Indian law. Uh, sure, sir. That was really insightful, and I believe no one has, no one was bored. So I have a couple of questions uh, of my own as well as from the audience. So uh, the first thing that I wanted uh, to ask you, like since you mentioned that there is no law specifically in the United States that you know restricts or controls one of the business operations. Suppose Facebook is a dominant player in the in one aspect of the market or one aspect of his business. Now there's no law to stop Facebook for using its resources that it, that it has made or using his uh, its uh, monopolistic powers that it has made or created in the so long period of his business to use this in another business operation that it wishes to launch. So is there any special uh, or any different mode of analyzing its market share, even though that company might be a new player in the new business operation? However, considering the backdrop that it is already dominant and has several resources to use in its new business operations, do you believe there should be a special analysis for analyzing its market share or monopolistic or monopolistic, or monopolistic powers? Well, Karteki, that's an excellent question. Um, um, and it's a question that the uh, Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission are trying to answer. Uh, but I think the answer is no. Um, there is no law in the United States preventing consolidated businesses. Uh, so these are um, companies that compete in a whole range of different complementary markets. There's no law against that. The only, and uh, about uh, 40 years ago, the Supreme Court decided that there was no, that, that there's no such concept as using your power that you have in the, your, your monopoly power. Remember, the possession of monopoly power is not illegal. It has to be coupled with something like dirty tricks. But the Supreme Court decided in Berkey versus Kodak that there was no law that prevented a company that had monopoly power in one market from gaining a competitive advantage in another market. Um, there may be a there may be a prohibition against using a monopoly in one market to get a monopoly in a second market, but not to gain a competitive advantage. So, so if you your your question focuses on whether. You can you, you have a new market entrant. You're trying to position it in the most vulnerable way. Can you sort of dissect an artificial market and show that the the monopolist in another market is trying to drown the new entrant in the second market? The answer is there is no concept like that. You can put it in the complaint, but actually it, it would probably be disregarded because the question is not whether the monopolist dominates. Remember, dominate or even monopoly power it doesn't have a negative connotation. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the possession of monopoly power is perfectly legal unless it's coupled with exclusionary activity. But competing aggressively is not exclusionary activity. So, for example, if Facebook saw a tiny little company called Instagram, and instead of buying it, had simply dumped huge resources into the same market and overwhelmed it, that would not be an antitrust violation because you would look independently at the second market, you would, you would ask 
well, actually, you would ask what its market share was and whether it was, if it had monopoly power and it was using exclusionary tactics to, to achieve a monopoly in the second market, then it might possibly, there might possibly be liability. But how do you show exclusionary tactics? The fact that you're excluding competitors is not exclusionary tactics because it's very clear that aggressive competition is supposedly the goal of the antitrust laws. So the fact that if Facebook had entered that market, sorry, Facebook had entered Instagram's market, created a product of its own, and driven Instagram and 20 other competitors out of business so that it had 100% of the market. If it was competing aggressively but didn't use exclusionary tactics, there would be no complaint, no legitimate antitrust complaint against it. Sounds strange? Yes, sir. Yes, it's, it's, it's a bit strange because this question essentially emanates from you know, one of the things that happen in India as well, when Jio, which is a company owned by Reliance Industries, entered the telecommunication market, right? So initially it uh, adopted such uh, like aggressively competitive activities and offered, in fact, free services like free internet and free voice calls to capture the market. And that's while the moment when the cases were filed uh, before the Competition Commission of India, uh, it was actually not a market leader during that time. So uh, actually yeah, that's- This is Rex, he wanted to say hello to people in India. Say Hi. hello, baby. <laughs> Go baby boy, Go to money. Sorry. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, this question emanated from Geo. So when the cases were filed, actually Geo was not dominant player in telecommunication market. So there was no kind of action taken against it. But now to, when we see uh, like Geo's position, it has actually, you know, gained sufficient or a large amount of market. So yeah, this question emanates from there. Uh, so moving on to the next question. So we have our vice chancellor. Uh, so so just to just to yes. just to follow yes. up on what you just said, in, uh, under in the United States, the same thing had happened. It's not a merger. It's only a market conduct issue. So you'd analyze it as an attempt as a monopolization question. And the question is, is there monopoly power? And if there is. Is it being sustained by artificial exclusionary means that are not designed to compete aggressively? So competing aggressively, advertising, giving promotions, um, doing everything you can to destroy your competitor because you are getting people to choose your product over them would be perfectly legitimate. Yeah. That's the consumer welfare standard at, at work. Yes. So, uh, so uh, we have uh, our vice chancellor, Vait uh, Kumari ma'am with us. So she wants to know uh, your opinion on, uh, so see, you pointed out this paradox in, which has happened in the, or uh, has taken place over the course of these years in the United States. So what account, according to you, should the law be in the future? Like, the, is there a change required in the law to solve this paradox or deal with this paradox? Like, what is your opinion on that? Well, uh, this, of course, depends on your, what your view of uh, what the law should be, right? Um, but I think that, uh, personally speaking, um, I, I think there is some value to, let's put it this way. The Sherman Act was passed in 1890. If you look at the legislative history of the Sherman Act, what it was talking about, well, and this was a at a time where Practically every industry in the United States was dominated by trusts. There was the sugar trust, the coal trust, the railway trust, the uh, oil trust, the, uh, every industry was subject to a trust. And the antitrust laws were passed because the conclusion was big is abusive and big is bad. And it is important as a matter of social life to preserve small and medium-sized businesses because they have a social value that's totally different from the economic value. And it's a fundamental social value that you wanna promote. So personally, I believe that. Uh, so in my opinion, the um, 
we should get rid of the consumer welfare standard in the Chicago School of Economic Analysis and go back to something that preserves smaller businesses. This, of course, would be unfair to the four big tech companies that have actually used the antitrust laws to get exactly where they are. But if you were to change the laws, there, there, there are two basic forms of antitrust law. One is merger law. So what you could do is you could basically say that the test should not be whether the merger would substantially lessen competition. You could put in hardcore bright line prohibitions that, for example, you have 20% of the market, you can't acquire more than 5% or something like that. Some very firm, non-discretionary, um, non-discretionary um, decision-making element that would just prohibit these mergers. Uh, just as a curiosity, right now there's a merger fight going on between uh, Aon and Willis, the first, the largest and third largest insurance broker, insurance, insurance brokerage companies in the world. And um, um, the Department of Justice has challenged this merger, although it, 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 may, it may lose, in fact. But um, oh, come here, come here, come here. The Department of Justice has challenged this merger, but the question is um, whether, um, whether, sorry, I'm just distracted for a moment. The, the question is whether or not Whether or not the antitrust laws, if, if the antitrust laws permit, you have three competitors because the market is defined to include only three competitors. If you have three competitors and two of them can merge so that customers are left with the choice of one or th of two companies, and that's permissible, there's something fundamentally wrong with the merger laws. So these need to change. Um, so I said that one, one way would be to include low level bright line merger prohibitions that prevent anybody who has an established market share from getting more. Second thing is to change the monopolization laws. Monopolization laws are the non-merger market conduct laws. And those, I mean, I, I personally, I, I'm not sure about the abuse of dominant position, but because it's so vague, um, but you could move from the existing monopoly, Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which we discussed before, to something like a more discretionary um, abuse of a dominant market position, which would allow more flexibility to challenge uh, market conduct that doesn't necessarily meet specified market shares. So the problem there, of course, is that you'd have more lawsuits with less certain answers because there's no basis. You'd have to start from scratch and there's no basis to decide what an abuse of a dominant position is, especially in this country where there's no concept of dominant position. That whole concept is alien and, and you have a whole lot of companies that have built up their market position based on complying with the antitrust laws. But I would say that you would have to get rid of the existing Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which couple, which currently controls uh, monopolization in order to achieve that goal. So I hope that is what. You know, I just want to because you did that make question. that, uh, you did make that distinction and, and the kind of the, the issues, uh, the complicated and the, you know, the, the multiple issues with this big tax are that there is the uh, violation of privacy, and that's an independent question than antitrust. But the issue of, viol uh, issue of violation of privacy is actually arising because of their, their position in the market. So uh, making the, the, the segregating the two, these two kind of change somewhere, what is the impact of their practices? Because presently what we are looking at is that are they reducing the prices, are they giving more benefits, et cetera, to the consumers? So that was the purpose, or that was the focus of the antitrust laws when they they were they've been created. But now we are fine, and these companies have very clearly 
bypass those because they are giving more benefits by monopolizing rather than creating a, 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 a difficult scenario for the consumers. But because of that monopolization by giving the benefits, they can now intrude on, intrude on our privacy. So there has to be that, that, that what is the impact of the practice rather than saying, are they giving more benefits or they're not going to giving more benefits? So I think some, some of that standard has to change as to determine who do you call as the monopolistic um, company or uh, they, they know violate the violation of the antitrust law. So giving the two separately is not, um, um, that's where the law's limitation is. That we are saying these are two different issues, but they're so interconnected. And unless we can create a connection between the two, we will be still dealing with antitrust laws as separate uh, issue and uh, the the issue of violation of privacy as a separate issue. Well, you 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 certainly make a very good point that these companies can do what they want, because, uh, <clears throat> including providing more services because they do have uh, monopoly power. You're absolutely right. Um, in, in this country. There, strangely enough, there is no federal privacy law of general application. There are special laws that govern the protection of uh, medical right, medical information, but there's general no privacy law. Uh, <clears throat> so the Federal Trade Commission is the agency that's responsible for dealing with privacy issues, and it's its basic conclusion is this is a contractual uh, arrangement. So in other words, if you have a privacy policy, most companies do, you have to disclose to the consumer exactly what you're collecting on them, how it's going to be used, what purpose it's going to be used for. And that's a contract. If you mislead the consumer and get their consent to use to collect private, private information based on your misleading them, which is exactly what Facebook did. It promised the consumers that the data it collected was not going to be sold, and, it, and they sold it to a whole range of people, including that um, uh, the, the political, uh, they sold it to a company that used it to target uh, political uh, advertising in the 2016 election. Um, if you breach your contract, if you breach the terms of privacy that you promised your consumer, the FTC will enforce those, uh, will, will enforce the law, which is you, you breach the commitment you made to the consumer. But, but on a federal level right now, there is no privacy, federal privacy law of general application. Um, it is it is true that a company that has monopoly power can, sorry, any large company that, that's profitable and can offer consumers benefits like, like Facebook or Instagram, they can basically induce consumers to give consent because they're providing a lot of free services in return. And of course, it's it's really not clear what you know. I haven't polled three hundred million consumers recently, but I have read studies that show convincingly that there is a probability that consumers are actually willing to part with to get to to part with private information in return for free services. So. So even if a company has monopoly power and is able to induce a consumer to part with um, private information that they're going to exploit in return for free services, I think that would be considered perfectly acceptable under U.S. law because um, because we our laws are sort of based on. Uh, Preserving as much freedom to operate as as you can. So, in other words, nobody's going to prohibit a consumer from delivering certain information if the consumer willingly does it, hasn't been misled, 
and the compact between the company and the consumer is uh, is kept uh, is maintained and honored. Um, so that 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 is not the result that you wanted, but do you at least argue, see the arguable response here? Yeah, but actually they're not giving free service. They are buying our private our, our private information, and without yes. paying us anything for that, and they're selling that for a much larger price. So what they suggest as a free service actually is getting them a lot more money than we get the free service for. Well, the, the question would be, the question would be, is that true? Um, for many consumers, the fact that they can use Instagram and communicate with their family or a whole network of people, uh, there there is a, there is an abstract benefit to that. I don't know what dollar value you place on it. So you're, you're comparing the economic value to Facebook from collecting this information versus the psychic value to the consumer for being able to use this service um, free of charge. Um, it's hard to place a quantity on that. Well, how would you How would you suggest that this be valued then? Because I think we certainly should uh, because some of the services are paid. They say that you're not, if you need more kind of uh, uh, um, actions on your app or on your program, then you pay this much more. So there are the free sections and there are the paid sections. So services, additional services are charged. So there is a possibility and certainly those charges will be uh, less, uh, will be more for the company than the money they would be spending on that. They are there for profit after all. They're not there for free service actually. So in that sense that if there is a quantification done of the uh, this the manner in which they, they provide charges for the additional services and whether the free services are worth the money they are actually getting by selling my information, which they have procured from me by offering me so-called free service. So suppose that, that they are selling the information uh, for fifty dollars, and they are providing me services worth ten dollars. So then, certainly there is there is a uh, so certainly you know, there there is space. I do not know how to do that quantification, but I certainly believe that there must be a way to find out that the free services they are offering, how much did that cost them, and how much are the benefits they're deriving by taking my uh, the, the, you know, what is the butter the free service with my privacy information. So for me, it's beneficial, but is it, is it, is it kind of somewhere not giving them a lot more power to sell that information for a lot more money? Then the worst well, thing you, you know, you know that providing me. I think that one of the complications of this, of the privacy issue is that uh, companies like, uh, some companies don't sell the information, they exploit it themselves. To benefit their own operations, and they use it to target uh, consumers with uh, with others' services that they think they would be likely to buy. So, um, but but I mean, I, I don't see any other way of, out of the quandary that you describe, except to, I mean, you'd almost have to have a computer screen that constantly calculates and balances. <laughs> the the benefit to the consumer versus the benefit to the company, and you're, you're sort of wondering if if you used a lot of Instagram this week, does your ratio go down or up? I mean, I, I and what would you do with smaller companies that um, if you if you have a standard rule and you 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 require companies to, for example, you basically tax them. You say if you get ten dollars, if you're going to get ten dollars worth of benefits from my consumer information, then I want $10 worth of benefits in return to me. How would you quantify that? And how would you transfer that from Facebook to a smaller company that wouldn't have the ability to do that? Or would you just impose it on Facebook? Yeah, but you're imposing on Facebook because they are monopolizing. The other companies are not. There has to be a well, different they, they have a, different they, they have a but you see, the, that's the I think question. I'll have to stop here. I can see a lot of questions in the chat box. 
So my students are also asking questions. So I think uh, because I, 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 I would be very that. happy to continue this debate with you offline at a later date so we can both learn more about it. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, sir, I Very believe, uh, yes. So, uh, if you have time, like uh, we can take the last couple of questions and then we can move on to the board of them. So, sir, the next question uh, comes from uh, Shreya Kapoor. So, she wants to know that uh, don't you think that most of the antitrust scrutiny against big tech is coming only because they are big? Aren't we accordingly paying too much focus on the market share and its effect? instead of other factors for assessing dominance? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, the, one of the answers is, as I said before, the idea of dominance is not a US concept. The question is, because the possession of monopoly power is not illegal, charging monopoly prices is not illegal the only question is if you have monopoly power are you coupling it with exclusionary activities so exclusionary activities would be that you for example make agreements with every possible uh supplier to cut off your competitor's supply uh, something like that um so i i i i think the answer to the question is that um You could have antitrust laws that just focus on, regardless of the market share, you put that aside and just focus yeah, on the, on the uh, actual market conduct. I'm sorry. No, I think uh, there's some technical glitch. So you may continue. Oh, so what I was saying was you, you could have, Uh, so I'll just take care of it. Uh, I'll try to mute up. I think what I was saying was you could have market conduct laws that focus on behavior in the market rather than your require the, the, rather than dealing with the market share. But that's much more difficult because don't forget the purpose of competition supposedly is to promote competition. That means that people have to compete aggressively and take business away from other people, including maybe even driving them out of business if they're if they're inefficient or if they don't have a product that appeals to people or if they don't market it correctly. I mean, there, there's no social welfare concept in aggressive competition. So the question is, do you want to have, do you want to have vigorous competition? If you go back to the 1890s, when the Sherman Act was passed, it's not really clear that they wanted to have vigorous competition. It's clear that they wanted to preserve small and medium-sized businesses. That was their goal. They they made the mistake of not being clear enough in the law about what the goal was. But um, but if you want to preserve small and medium-sized businesses and lessen the significance of aggressive competition, all you have to do is change the law. You change the law to say that um it, 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 to, to give a cause of action to people whose businesses are destroyed by competition that would be incredibly complicated because then the question would be did they fail because they were no good or did they fail because some other company used competitive manipulation like did you did you specifically target one new competitor and put them out of business just to make it just to preserve a stronger market for yourself on the other hand if you truly believe in competition uh shouldn't the best product be allowed to be promoted in the most aggressive form possible so that consumers can at least hear about and try and, and see if they actually believe that the product is better. Well, I mean, the, nobody forced anybody to use Facebook. Facebook became a product that people liked because it served their purposes. It, in fact, created an idea that didn't exist before, the idea of you know, self-publishing endless numbers of pictures about yourself. And um, it's free. 
So it, I mean, that's an interesting concept. Um, it created a market where no product existed before. And um, uh, it's a product that, it's a concept that took off. How, how would you control that? If people, if, for example, with the app store business, suppose people want to use iPhones and they want to have, they want to have a technology that is malware free and always works, which means that you have to have some standards for the apps. Supposing that was their priority, um, are you going to mandate unlimited competition if it's going to destroy the technology? You, you have to decide what you want. But uh, in this country, at least, the the and by the way, the the ultimate paradox of this whole thing is these four companies are incredible financial resources for the United States. They have revolutionized technology around the world and they produce huge amounts of money for the United States. So the very concept of the United States government trying to destroy them is just ludicrous. But but that's an incidental question. The question really is if you if you if you if you want to preserve small and medium sized businesses, you basically have to place a tax on large companies that makes it uh, difficult or impossible for them to operate. So that's a social choice. But when you make that social choice, you have to be aware that there's a certain efficiency and energy level and uh, it, potential innovation that comes from having large companies. And if you just, if you eliminate them, you may be eliminating incidental benefits that flow to society as well. So it's a complicated thing. I don't think the current set of corrupt politicians in Washington uh, actually know how to deal with that. 